Yeah, I'm gonna wait one more minute. Okay, so welcome back and let me start to share the screen. Okay, so welcome back. And we're gonna continue to talk about uh, some simple language, which, have, which is for the integer expressions. Okay, so let me just give you some quick reminder of what we did so far. So we, this is reminder. So last time we tried to study, we, oh actually we studied the, some very simple programming language, which is designed to express integer expressions. And that's what we are studying right now. And then for, for this language, the abstract syntax of this language was like this, it's an integer expression. And integer expressions are constants, zero, one, and so on. And then there are variables. And there's a minus sign, unary operation. Why? Okay. So there's a unary operation. And then there was a binary operation. It's a very simple-minded language, which appears in pretty much any programming language that you encounter before. But then in order to study this language formally, we looked at a few concepts, which are something called the abstract grammar. And then we also looked at notion of abstract syntax and then abstract phrase. And abstract grammar is essentially the grammar that you see on the screen, which is a grammar from the perspective of lang language specification. It's a highly ambiguous grammar. So it's not a grammar designed to describe a parsing. It's more about describe, it's designed to specify what kind of derivation trees uh, can be obtained in the grammar. So it's a specification of finite trees. And then abstract syntax, where I said, it's gonna be all the derivation trees in this abstract grammar. So the one example is, is like this. So one plus X. So this is one instance of abstract syntax so all these trees form the abstract syntax. So another is going to be something like x and x, y, and so on. All the finite derivation tree according to the grammar is an abstract syntax. An abstract phrase is one of these trees. So that's one way to understand this notion of abstract grammar, syntax, and phrase. And I also explain 
abstract grammar syntax phrases can be understood more abstractly or more mathematically using in terms of algebra and signature. So I said the abstract grammar is nothing but a specification of so-called signature, which is like a specific, it's very much like Java interface. It specify types and specify constants and operations. And abstract syntax can be understood as a, it's a mathematically it's an algebra of the specific signature specified by the abstract grammar. But this algebra is called uh, initial algebra. So from the, uh, based on the analogy between what's going on here and what, ha what happens in Java, signature is more like an interface. Algebra is more like a class implementing an interface. Initial algebra is in a sense canonical implementation of, of the interface. And abstract phrase are the elements of the initial algebra. So that's what we, we talked about before. And then the key characteristic of initial algebra is that for any algebra to the same signature, there exists a unique homomorphism. Okay? And that is actually very important because that's what we're gonna use today. So I talk a little bit about so-called syntax directive definition. And then today we're gonna, I'm going to talk about so-called structural induction. And then both of them are really hold because the abstract syntax is an initial algebra more mathematically, or you can view them as some way of doing inductive definitions or recursive definition where recursion is well-defined because the abstract phrases are just finite tree. It will never be an infinite tree. If it's an infinite tree, it's not defined, but because it's a finite tree, both of them are defined. So here's, so let's go to the topic that we I want to talk about. The topic I want to talk about is a syntax directive definition. So this will be used again and again for many different programming languages, because in all the programming languages we consider, syntax will be essentially the follow the same recipe, it's going to be an uh, initial algebra or abstract syntax, and then it's gonna be specified abstract, abstract grammar, in other words, a signature. So, and then in all of those cases, it's, okay, it's possible to define things in, term, in this way, which is called syntax direct definition, because all these things are initial algebras or abstract syntax. So syntax direct definitions, can very, I mean, understood very intuitively. I mean, you can say this is a definition on some operator or predicates on integer expressions. And, but it's specified by the two things. So the first important bit is, it's specified by case analysis. And the second thing is it, it's defined by induction or recursion. So case analysis, induction, these are the main characteristics of syntax directed definition. So I think the best way to understand this is to actually see an example. So let me define an example, which is a free variable operator. What this operator does, it takes integer expression, and then it returns all the variable that appears in the given integer expression. So this means it's a mapping from integer expressions to the power set of the variables. So just like I said before, this is a notation that says collection of all subsets of variable. Okay. So, 
frame. So now the question is, how can we define this? And the way to define this is actually pretty easy. I mean, if you think about the, this writing a program that take integer expression, which is essentially a finite tree, and then return a set of variables that appears in a finite tree, I mean, the easy way is to define in terms of uh, case analysis, or if you are familiar with programming languages supporting pattern matching, we can define it in terms of pattern matching. So here's how we define this. We say, define this free variable operator, and we do case analysis. So the case analysis is the first property that I mentioned to you here. And then the cases we are, we are analyzing are constant case, variable case, and then unary operator minus case and binary operator plus my, I mean minus multiplication and division. So we said, if it is a constant, so the C means constant zero, one, and so on, free variable that appears is an empty set, okay? And then for the variable case, free variable appears in this expression is just this variable X. And then the third case is for the unary expression. If it's a unary, the um, unary operation, unary operation case is free variable is just free variable of its argument expression E. So here I'm using the point, which is an induction or recursion. But one thing I want you to notice is that this inductions is with respect to immediate sub, uh, sub expression. So what does that mean? That means I'm not really looking inside of this argument expression E, okay? And then do some case analysis about it. I just do the case, I mean, to call this recursions only with respect to the immediate sub expression E without looking at the deeper inside the E, okay? So this is the, another big property of this syntax directed definition. In the last case, the, well, the other cases are also quite easy. If it's a plus operation, E1 and E2. And then this is a, we say it's a free variable of E1, union. So it's free variable E1, union, free variable of E2. And then the, for multiplications, division, and then uh, yeah, subtraction, they are all defined in the same way. Compute the free variable first argument and free variable with the second arguments. Now here's an, so this is the definition. Do the case analysis based on constant variable minus operation and plus operation. Really, I mean, we do a case analysis on the constant, but actual mathematical definition can do case analysis for each of the individual constants. But I mean, this is a kind of typical way to define the syntax directed definition. So the case analysis, and then if necessary, we do the recursions with respect to the immediate subphrase, like argument E1 and E2. Okay. Okay. So here's a one exercise I want you to do. So this strange happens. So, so there is a very important operator we're gonna analyze quite a bit, which is called substitution operator. That again appears quite a lot in many different programming languages. What is a substitution? Substitution operator is written as a delta. That is a mapping from variable to integer expression in this case. So, I mean, one substitution operator may be defined by, say, it maps variable x to you know, x plus one, but all the other variable y would maybe map to y, okay? So that's a one example of substitution operator. Well, I'm gonna give you some notations for the sub, well, actually let's use the appropriate notation here. 
So I'm going to write it substitution operator like this, 2x plus 1, which means that you map variable x to x plus 1, all the other variable get mapped to itself. Okay, so if I apply delta to y, it's going to be the same as y. So, so this is a substitution operator. And then the exercise I want you to do, so let's say all the substitution, we write it as a subst to mean the set of all the substitution operator. So then what I want you to do is, I want you to define this operator that I wrote here that takes integer expression and then substitution operator and return an integer expression. It, what it does is that it just applies a substitution. So if we have, say, in x plus y, then let's apply, let's call this a delta zero. If you apply to delta zero, then delta zero doesn't sub, sub, replace x by x plus one, doesn't replace all the other variables. So the result has to be x plus one plus y. So really x plus y is a tree that looks like this. And then the outcome is another tree that looks like this. So that's what this substitu substitution operator is working. So the exercise is define the operator this uh, in a syntax directed way. Okay, so that's what I want you to do. I will give you uh, in three minutes to do so. So, okay, let me show you the answer here. Answer is quite simple. So if you think about how to write an actual program to do so. So if 
we have a constant applied to the substitution. So we will do case analysis on the first argument, which is the, exp which is the integer expressions. Okay. So if you have a constant and apply the substitution, it doesn't have any variables, so the result is going to be constant. And then if we have a variable x applied to the substitution, what we will do is that we will apply the substitution to replace x by appropriate uh, integer expression. And after all, this is why, why we are applying the substitution. We want to replace variable by something else. Okay. And then for minus sign, what we do is that we apply substitution to expression, argument expression E and plus minus sign. So what this mean, means in terms of the trees, I said this expression E is a finite tree. So we said we apply substitution delta to finite tree E. And then this entire outcome is going to be another finite tree. And then this minus and this uh, finite tree notation really means put a minus on top of this finite tree. Okay, so that's what this operation is meaning. And in fact, if you write these programs, I mean, the, the substitution using OCaml, you can actually see that all these manipulations correspond to tree manipulations. Okay. And then the last case, I mean, there are binary operator case, and I'm gonna give you only for plus, with E1 plus E2, apply with substitution delta then we apply the substitution for the first part and then apply the substitution for the second part and we add that these two results together. So again, in terms of a tree, the first, argue, the first recursive call will return one tree, second recursive call will return another tree and we try to put these two trees together by putting plus sign on the top. So that's what uh, this operator is telling us. And multiplication and the others are defined the same way. Okay. And then, okay, so that's a one that mean, uh, so the, yeah, so that's the application of the substitution. Okay. As I said, this syntax direct definition is, is, is a kind of, I mean, some tools that we are using over and over again when we study the, the syntax or semantics of programming languages. So here's one, uh, another application of this syntax direct definition, but this is very important. And that one is denotational semantics. So far, we, when we look, study about integer expressions, we said they are just, I mean, finite tree is a very syntactic object. It doesn't have any mathematical meaning as like functions or numbers and so on. Instead, it, it's a very kind of combinatorial syntactic object that we are constructing. So denotational semantics try to assign the meaning. So intuitively what they try to do is they try to map all these in syntactic objects in our case, expressions, or you can say abstract phrases. To mathematical objects. In, in a syntax direct way. So just like what I told you before, syntax direct way means we do case analysis and also we're gonna use induction or recursions to do the to give the definition. Okay. So so th and then the and this is a more like technical definition of denotational semantics, and often people say this syntax directed approach is called compositional. Because what happens here is that uh, this uh, denotational semantics is the, the denotational semantics of entire integer expression is defined by denotational meaning of by combining denotational meaning of 
it's a sub-expression by composing the notational meaning of sub-expressions. So this syntax direct way is sometimes called compositional in, the, in this context of denotational semantics. And really, I mean, this is a technical definition, but what it try to do is that it try to define a meaning. Define a meaning of each expression So, I mean, this meaning will intuitively correspond to your understanding about what this expression means. And we clarify your intuitive understanding using this type of formal mathematical formula. So how you do it? And so to do so, there are two key steps in the denotation of semantics. The first, actually the most important step of the denotation of semantics is, is really defining semantic domain So this is, in a sense, a key step in denotation of semantics. So in this setup, what does this mean? This means that we're gonna define uh, this map that I'm talking about, and that map will be written in this way. Okay, it's written like this. And so this is written, Kind of note, I heard this is a notation used by Dana Scott, who is the, in, in a sense, creator of the notation of semantics. So that's an operator that take integer expression. And then, uh, so you take an integer expression and you map it to some mathematic, uh, mathematical elements, okay? And then by semantic domain, I mean the specifying these targets of the, this semant I mean, this mapping is what I mean by the ab abstract domain. So what this target space actually look like, that's the, in a sense, key steps of the denotation of semantics. Once you define this target and have a good understanding about what it is, this syntax directed definition comes almost automatically. So now what's, what's the target should be? This target should, should be the space for, in which we can assign the meaning of each integer expressions. So if you think about integer expression like x plus y, you may think, think that, oh, this has to be an integer. Okay. But actually it's not, it's not an integer because you can't really give a integer to this expression. You can do it only when you know the value of variable x and value of variable y. So this has to be a mapping, that its meaning has to be a mapping from something that lives in these are functions that takes sigma to integers. And this is sigma is a, what we call states, and that will provide the meaning of all the variables. Okay. So, so this meaning, so let me just write it more accurately. So the, this operator is written like this. So if you apply this operator to integer expression x plus y, that has to live in, it has to be a function. That function take what I will call state. So this is called state. And then it will return an integer. And then that's what the state does is that it provides a meaning to all the variables in the expressions. I mean, all the variables. So state has to be, state has to be a mapping from variable to the integers, okay? So just to say it again, this target space is, yeah, just write it again. It's a mapping from integer to Z, and then this is sigma, I mean, is, is defined by a mapping from the variable to integers. And then we will use notation like sigma to range over elements in sigma. And this is called the state. Okay, so just to, I mean, so what this means is that we're gonna understand what well, we will interpret each integer expressions as a mapping from states to integers. 
So how you do it? Well, our definition is a syntax directed. So we do case analysis. So integers, we, we have to define this mapping from sigma to C. And then if it's a variable, we also do mid map this is to C and so on. And it's defined like this. For the constant case, it's a mapping that takes state sigma. So I will use, I mean, maybe I'll use two not lambda notation, but let me just first write it this way. It takes argument to sigma and map it to a constant value C, okay? So here the C is a constant, so it takes map state sigma and map it to constant C. And that's what we should do because it has to be a function. And I will write notation like lambda sigma dot C to mean our functions that take sigma as an argument and return C as a, as a result. And I'm sure, I guess most of you are familiar with Python and in Python, if you want to define anonymous functions, you have to use lambda. And so that's the same lambda notation here. In this case, it's a function that takes state sigma. And then it will return, it has to return integers, but that integer should be the value of this variable x. And that's done like this. So it should be lambda sigma dot uh, sigma of x. So that's the interpretation for the variable. Uh, for, for the semantics of minus e, it again has to be a function, so from sigma to something. But what it does is that now we have first, the meaning of this is, it's a meaning of this argument expression, e, and it's negating it. So we put, compute the meaning of argument expression e, and then we apply sigma that will give an integer. And then we will negate that integer. So this is not a tree operation. This is an integer negation. It's a, it's a in putting the negation sign or minus a sign in front, of, in front of the integer. It's not. But you can see that here in the definition, we use the, I mean, the recursive induction, inductions on it's a sub immediate sub expression. And if you write it using lambda, you can write it like this. Expression E sigma. Yes. And then for the plus, it's defined takes a sigma as an argument, and then it first computes, take the semantics and apply sigma, then that will give a value of expression E1, and take the semantics of the second expression, apply sigma, they will give the value of second expression, we add them together. Again, this is an integer plus operator. So the, I mean, the plus here, This is a three operation. And the plus on this side is something different. This is really integer operation. So don't be confused. I mean, it looks like we are using defining plus in terms of a plus, which is a circular. That's not the case. We are really using the mathematical plus minus operations to define the meaning of what plus operator on trees actually means. And that corresponds to your understanding. This one has to be of, I mean, given a sigma. I mean, it's really the addition means addition. And this is exactly express this, this idea. Sigma E1, sigma plus. So here's another exercise I wanted to do. So one thing that you can do using this denotation of semantics is to actually prove two expressions are equal, okay? So one thing that you are expecting to be true is if you say two times x, that has to be same as x plus x as a meaning. 
as a tree, they are different. I mean, these two times x looks like it's a tree, which looks like this. X plus x is a, as a tree, it's a completely different tree, right? But as a, if you think about its meaning, they mean the same thing. So what I want you to do is I want you to use this semantics to show this equality. So I will give you two minutes to do so. Okay, so let me tell you how to solve this. I mean, both of them, th this is a mapping from sigma to integers. And this is also a mapping from sigma to integers. So to show these two things are equal, what we can do is that if these two things are equal, for all states, For sigma, so then this this one will imply the one on the top. Okay, so now how to do it? Then the way you will do the interpretation is just look at the semantics. The semantics say this left hand side is equal to interpretation of first, and then multiply. This is the integer multiplications, and then interpretation of x, and then multiply. They, they, and then you multiply these two things together. And the constant case, if you go to the this constant case, the constant case is the same as itself, so it's a two. And then this uh, variable case, variable case it's just a sigma of x. So we have two times sigma of x. And the right hand side is in the same if we follow the interpretations, sigma plus x sigma. And then this is again for the variable case, so sigma x plus sigma x. So for the integers, we know that for something, if you add it itself, it's same as two times itself. So these two things are equal. So that's what, why this equality is always true. So here we are using a very simple mathematical reasoning. And then we are lifting this very simple mathematical reasoning to the reasoning of our programs. So if this is exactly what you expect. I mean, like just you might say it's really simple, but the point I'm making is that in do by doing this entire process, you can make reasoning of our program very rigorous and formal. And that's what's needed to justify compiler optimizations and so on. Okay, so before moving on, let me mention I mean, two things. The reason why we can do the syntax directed definition is because when you do the syntax directed definition, we are really defining on, on algebra. And integer expression is an initial algebra. So that's why there is a unique homomorphism from integer expression to the algebra that we are defining. So implicitly, this syntax directed definition is defining algebra. Okay. So this guy implicitly Define on an, an algebra. 
Who's on the line set? Is this one the function space from state to the values, and and then this the the reason why these things are well defined, and one one way to justify why this thing is well defined, and this is snapping is well oh, just, uh, be in this is this mapping can be understood as the unique algebra homomorphism. And the same thing for the variable. Now that's the first comment. The second comment is, I mean, many of you maybe, if you take course on programming languages or if you have used functional languages, any kind of functional languages before, you may see the operation called fold right and and then maybe you might have experienced some exercise which asks you to define the fold to some more general type if you haven't done it don't worry i mean this type this but this kind of thing appears quite a lot and the fold is in a sense one of the key tools that people use to write functional programming well and this fold is really the uh, algebra in this unique algebra homomorphism. So really what you are, when you write, uh, provide an argument to fold right, you are defining an algebra, and then the, this fold right is really semantically or mathematically, what it means is a unique algebra homomorphism. So the situation is very similar to what's going on in this syntax directed definition. Okay, so now let's move on to the next. So, so far what we did, we talk about syntax direct definitions, and then we define free variable operator, substitution operator, and then we also define the denotational semantics. And I said denotational semantics can be used to reason about programs, integer expressions. And then there is other things that we want to do. Okay, four. So the study about programming languages is to study the mathematical property of the entire language itself instead of a specific program. So studies are a bit different from the other I mean, courses that you learn in the, during the undergrad or graduate degree and all other courses you learn about specific algorithm and specific programs. Programming language is about the entire language in which you can write many different programs. So it's an analysis about the program. So often we want to analyze programming language and want to prove some properties about programming languages. And one very important tool is called structural induction. What does this mean? This is very, it's, it's essentially an induction, but where we can make induction hypothesis on immediate sub-expressions. So we use a structural induction to prove pro certain properties always are true, properties are true for all expressions. So induction on integer expressions. Mm -hmm. Property is true for all integer expressions, but the key part of this proof technique is that we can, uh, yeah, we can use our inductions. We can make induction hypothesis, and then the induction hypothesis can be made for immediate sub-expressions. If I mean another way to understand this is that it's a, maybe I said integer expressions. Their abstract phrases are finite trees, so you can think of this as a. Uh, induction on the depth of finite trees. That's one way to understand this. But another way to understand this is that it's really coming from this initial algebra stuff that I talked about. But regardless of where it comes from, 
as a proof technique, this is something we're going to use over and over again in this language and many other languages. So the first property I want to, I, mean, I will prove some property and I will ask you to use the structural induction to prove another property. So here's a very important dilemma, which is called coincidence. So what this lemma tells us is that suppose we have an expression, we have uh, two substitutions, and not two substitutions, we have uh, two states, which means they are sigma and sigma prime and elements of capital sigma, which is a map set of all the mappings from variable to integers. So we have uh, two states, and we have an expression, integer expression. But then we know that for uh, sigma x, sigma and sigma primes are the same for all the free variable appearing in, in E. So then we expect that it doesn't really matter whether we plug in sigma to get the value of E or we plug in sigma prime to get the value of E. Okay. So if that's the case, then the meaning of E, and if you look at the integer value by applying the state sigma, so meaning was a map from sigma to integer. So if you plug in the state parameter sigma, you get an integer value. This whole thing is going to be an integer. And this integer value is the same as expression E with sigma prime. I mean, in theory, these two things may be different because they are given two different parameters. But they say that if two things are always the same. Now, if you take a step back and think about what this theorem is telling us, this is exactly what you expect. Because, I mean, for Given an expression, the state matters only via what state can influence the value of expression only via the va variables appearing in expression E. So sigma and sigma prime say the exactly the same thing for all the free vari variables appearing in E. It shouldn't matter whether we use a sigma or a sigma prime to, to evaluate expression. Okay. So that's what this one is telling us. And this theme will appear over and over again. So the coincidence generally means if we are, when you interpret some fragments of a programs or some fragments in logic and so on, if all the dependent, if they, we are given two parameters which say the same thing for those that can affect this uh, fragments, then we have the same meaning. I think my explanation is vague, but so this, this is a coincident theorem. Then we can prove this using structural induction. So the proof by structural induction is same as, uh, it's very much like syntax direct definition. So we do case analysis, and then instead of using inductions, or I mean the make a recursive call, we use induction, we use the induction hypothesis. Okay, so the, let's prove this, and then I will show you, handle only a few cases. So that because we do case analysis, we consider the case where expression E is equal to constant, is some constant, so in this case, this is actually the one of the base case. We have to show that, uh, so I mean, to prove this, we assume we let sigma and sigma prime be states such that satisfy this property. Of course, the expression E is given, and then we pick sigma and sigma prime satisfy this property. Now the first case is if expression E is equal to constants, what we have to show is that expression E and uh, 
E under sigma prime are the same. This is what we have to show, but that's the case because expression E under sigma is a constant C. In this case is again constant C, so they are equal. So they we are done in this case. And then the second case is expression E is equal to variable. If it's a variable, then we have, right, so we again, what we have to show is that x sigma is equal to x sigma prime. But sigma, I mean, x sigma, same as the, just looking at the value of x in the, sub, in the state sigma. And x sigma prime, again, looking at the value of x under sigma prime. But what we know is that x is a free variable of x. So this sigma of x and sigma prime of x should be the same. I mean, that was for all the free variables, sigma and sigma prime are the same. That was the condition that we, we have here. So that these two things are equal. And then, I mean, the, the only other case I'm going to deal with you is, is the, this one. Let's deal with two other cases, minus expression E1. So we have to show uh, so let me write it more formally and show that like a minus d1 sigma okay is equal to minus e1 on the sigma prime minus e1 sigma in the semantics so that's the same as d1 on the sigma but this is equal and it's because free variables of E and free variables, set of free variables of E1, they are exactly the same. So we can apply induction hypothesis to for E1. E1 is a subphrase, a sub expressions of E. So we can apply induction hypothesis as long as this condition is true with respect to E1, right? Here we are talking about E if the condition is with respect to E1 we can apply induction hypothesis. In this case, it's possible because free variables of E and free variables, set of free variables of E1 is the same. So by applying induction hypothesis, this is the same as sigma prime, and that is same as minus E1 sigma prime. So here we use induction hypothesis. And the, two, the other two equalities are definitions. Now here are some, a bit, I mean, this is also easy, but it uh, requires a bit of, need to be a bit more careful. If you have E1 plus E2. Okay. In this case, what we have to show is E1 plus E2. And this is what we have to prove. Now, what we know is that the left hand side by the semantics is a E1 sigma plus E2 sigma. Right hand side is E1 sigma prime plus E2 sigma prime. And then you might think that, oh, now we are applied the induction hypothesis, then we are done. But actually, you can do it, but one has to be a bit more careful. Uh, now, if you compare the free variables of E and E1 and E2, free variable, set of free variables of E contains the set of free variables of E1. Also, set of free variables of E contains set of free variables of E2. What does this mean? This means that now the conditions that we assumed here, which is this condition, for E, it's going to be true for E1 and E2 as well, because this condition say for X in free variables of E, sigma of X is equal to sigma prime of X. And because the set of free variables of E is a superset of the set of free vari variables of E1 and also the set of free variables of E2, this condition will continue to be true for E1 and E2. Okay. So what this means is that this condition 
And then what do you have here? Set. So somehow something strange happens. Uh, I don't know where this come from, but let's ignore this. Okay, so right. So then the this this condition will be true. So we what we know is in uh, okay, it's not disappearing. So in so if I just write it down explicitly, we know that sigma of x, sigma prime of x, true for all x, which appears in free variables of e1. And also the same statements, true for all free variables of e2. Okay, so then that just help us, I mean, let us to use, so we can use the induction hypothesis. If you use the induction hypothesis, you know that E1 sigma is equal to E1 sigma prime. The same thing, E2 sigma is equal to E2 sigma prime. And now, because this E1 sigma is equal to E1 sigma prime, E2 sigma is equal to E2 sigma prime, these two things are equal, so then we are done. And there are other cases like the multiplications, minus and division, all these cases can be handled in a similar way. Now, here's an exercise I want you to do. So, but, okay, as an exercise, it's important, but also the theorem itself is important. This coincidence theorem said, for free variable, two states should say the same thing, the meaning is the same. And there's another very important theorem, which is called substitution theorem, which I want you to do. So use a structural induction to prove this substitution theorem. So the substitution theorem say the following. So here we have substitution delta. So what was substitution is a mapping from variable to integer expressions. And then we have a two, we have a state sigma and sigma prime. Yes, the, uh, and then we have expression E, integer expression. And then the theorems say that the actually the syntactic substitution that we defined in the early part of the lecture is the same thing I mean it correspond to the semantic substitution so that's intuitively what this one say about correspondence between syntactic and substitution and semantic substitution. And the theorem say the following, if uh, so sigma prime of x is the same as delta of x sigma so what does this mean? For every variable x, in sigma prime of x remembers the meaning of what's gonna we're gonna get after applying the substitution under sigma. If that's the case, so then expression e and the Sigma saying this is a for all for 
earthly variable x in expression e. So that, that's the same as uh, expression e under sigma prime. And now if I abuse the notation a little bit, so if I can write this notation as, I mean, this is the informal notation. So if you, informal notation is that if we write sigma prime as sigma delta, so it's an informal notation doesn't quite correspond to what's going on here, but it will give you a good intuition about what's really happening. So sigma prime is obtained from sigma in some by applying this substitution delta. So we we apply the substitution delta in this in the sense that's written as an equation. So then the the fine the conclusion of this theorem say if you do apply substitution syntactically and compute its value on the sigma. That's the same as computes E after applying substitution semantically. Okay, so, so that's what this, this theorem is telling us, correspondence between syntactic and semantic substitution. So here's an exercise I want you to do. Approve this lemma by structure induction. Okay, so I will give you three minutes to do so.
okay. So let me show you how to do this. Proof is actually quite easy. So we will by we proof is by structural induction. And then we will assume that this delta sigma sigma prime expression E R is as given in the lemma. Okay, so we assume that there are the just like the ones given in the lemmas in the lemma. And then we do the case by structure the proof by structural induction on this expression E. So we do case analysis. The first case is expression E is equal to some constant. In this case, if you compute delta and sigma, that is constant C delta sigma. And substitution doesn't do anything for the constant. Then also the on the sigma, the constant is the same as the constant. And at the same time, if you we compute the other one. This is also constant sigma prime. And then that's the same as constant. So these two things are equal. Then the other case is for the variable. I mean, another case is for the variable. So if you have a variable x, substitutions and sigma, then substitution actually acts on the variable. So the outcome is going to be expression obtained by applying the substitution, then we give an interpretation of sigma. But well, we know that because of the, one of the assumption, I mean, essentially sigma prime is what we can get by applying substitution on sigma, so this equality. And that allows us to rewrite this as sigma prime of x. And that is same as x, the meaning of x on the sigma prime. So this case is okay, this case is also okay. And then the third case, expression E is equal to uh, minus E1. Let's skip this case and then just think about binary case e1 plus e2 then we have a e1 plus e2 apply substitution and then give an interpretation now if you apply the substitution there apply substitution the first argument second argument then add them together then the meaning of this is meaning of E1 delta sigma plus E2 delta sigma by the definition of the semantics. But then here, just like the plus case that I described before, I mean, if sigma and sigma prime satisfy the relationship that's written here, this relationship written for expression E, then it also satisfies similar kind of relationship for E1 and E2. So what this means is we can apply induction hypothesis. Hypothesis here. So if you apply induction hypothesis, so then we get E1, under sigma prime, E2 under sigma prime, and that's the same as E1 plus E2 under sigma prime. So here we use induction hypothesis. Okay, so then other cases can be proved in a similar way. We skipped, we didn't include all the cases, but other cases can be proved in a similar way. Now for this theorem is quite important. So the correspondence and as well as this substitution, the correspond I mean, this is really meaning syntactic and semantic substitution are in a sense the same thing. I mean, they are closely related. I mean, these are the quite important results, but 
the form that we will encounter often is this one. This is a corollary. And in this corollary, I'll first write down the corollary and then explain the notation there. So this is a corollary, and let me just explain the, what's, all the components there first. What's written here, it means a substitution. And this, I already described this to you. So it's a substitution that maps xi to di, but if variable y is not one of x1 up to xn, it's going to be mapped to a variable y. So it's a substitution for which maps x1 to e1, x2 to e2, and so on. But all the other variable, it doesn't do anything. It's just working as an identity. And this is a notation that is a bit like an update of notations for state. So it's a, in, so it's a repeated application of these notations. So first, e1 on the sigma, this is a integer value, right? So this is an integer value, say, uh, n1. Okay. Let's use it. Yeah, this is another, in, this is integer, well, not n, but constant c1. Integer value cn. So it's really said, we're going to update sigma where x1 will have a value c1, x2 have a value c2, up to xn will have a value cn. Now what this update means? This is a, is a state, so it's going to be a map from variable to integers. Now, if we plug in variable x, it's going to be the updated value v. Okay, so value v that we just updated. For other cases, it will be just the old value, which is a sigma of y. So this notation means that for x1 will be mapped to c1, to xn will be mapped to cn. Otherwise, all x, which is different from x1 to xn, will be mapped to sigma of x. So that's what this notation is telling us. It say that if you apply this expression, if you apply this substitution, and then give an interpretations according to sigma, that's the same as applying essentially the substitution on the state. So ex leave ex expression alone, alone. So expression doesn't change. For the state part, we just change it so that x1 will now map to the meaning of e1 and so on. And this equality is true. And that's what we're going to use quite often. And why it's useful? It's useful because when we prove some properties about expressions, we often, if you use a, this uh, structural induction, that means you have to do case analysis over and over again. But if you use this substitution lemma and correspondence lemma, often you can avoid some this case analysis, just derive a property you care about directly. So it lets you avoid case analysis. Okay. But it's as a, I mean, this is a quite important theorem that, I mean, statement and the actual theorem in this integer expression language it's a bit less important than what is the form of this theorem. The form of this theorem is correspondence between substitution and the semantic update or semantic substitution. So that's what's important. It appears repeatedly in our different languages. Now to finish up, let me mention one more thing and then finish now. The one last bit I want to say is that, and you might ask where this induction come from. So it actually come from, the answer is that it come from initiality.
of our in the integer expression. So what does this mean? This means that whenever you define the Mituda structural induction proof, we are really defining, so we are really defining uh, an algebra. where the underlying set. So if we use a structural induction to prove some property P, so suppose that's a property that we want to prove, then we are really defining an algebra where the underlying set set is integer expressions. So I will write it uh, integer expression E such that E satisfies P. So if, so if it's, we just collect integer expression which satisfies P, uh, right. so if it satisfies P, then that I mean, actually the structural induction proof is really about defining some sub-algebra based on this. And uh, now you, if you use the initiality and so on, then you can prove that actually this set is same as integer expression. And this is a general phenomenon of initial algebra. For initial algebra, there is the so-called induction principle that's exactly correspond to this structural induction. If you don't understand what I'm talking about, very likely because I didn't really explain everything, but the, I mean, just the point I'm making is that although we are doing things very concrete, the abstract understanding has a close relationship with what we are doing right now. Okay, so that's it for today, and I'm going to stay here for about five more minutes. So if you have any questions, you can ask me. Okay, thanks all for coming this early lecture.